They already knew if God could save me, he could save anybody. So thanks for backing me up on that. All right, you ready to do this? I'm ready. I'm always ready. <laughs> I invited uh, Colleen to join me uh, this, e- this morning because, uh, uh, well, this is sort of her, her deal, the whole thing of uh, worship and praise. Uh, she's the, uh, the resident expert, I guess I would say about that. I don't um, know about that. But, uh, we'll let Jocelyn take that. <laughs> you know, ordinarily when I'm uh, sitting down with the Lord and gathering what's on his heart for his people, y'all, uh, uh, we don't normally communicate a whole lot about what I'm pinning and putting down. Uh, no, I, I, I actually prefer all the years I've led worship for different pastors and whatever. I prefer not to know what they're preaching about. Um, one of the reasons is because I love Sunday after Sunday sitting down, listening to a sermon and thinking, Oh, that's why the Lord told me to pick that song. I just love that experience of seeing how... Now, God may want to say something different during the singing part of a worship service and the preaching part, but I can't tell you how many times it's just been spot on. Mm-hmm. And even now that it's my husband, you think I would know, but... Yeah, uh. but this week was something of an exception because, uh, well, like I said, you know, I trust her, her uh, instincts and perspective on these things. So as I'm developing these points, uh, we actually spent a lot more time together this week uh, talking about uh, this message. And so I thought, yeah, you should just come up and chime in uh, as you feel led. Okay? <laughs> Makes him a little nervous. Did you hear that? As I, you feel led. I've given directions to Josh to uh, <laughs> cut the mic when needed. Uh, <laughs> I don't need a mic. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for these kids that were up here, Lord. I thank you for uh, the, seeing a next generation of worship leaders. By the way, y'all, that's kind of why we, why we do this periodically, bring kids up here, because this is stuff that puts a seed in the heart of children, where it's like, you know what, I want to keep doing that. That, that worked for me. And uh, yeah, we're, we're a training church, um, you know, probably because we're old now. We, we're just all about training the next generation, you know, and so this is, this is where it begins. And so, Father, I, I thank you for these kids. I thank you, Lord, that uh, each and every one of them are going to grow up uh, knowing you and walking mm-hmm. with you, not in a nominal way, but uh, in a uh, heartfelt, uh, f- fully devoted way of making you Lord as you should be. And uh, I give you thanks for that. So thanks, Lord, for uh, this morning, for all that you've already done. Um, and I ask you will help uh, Colleen and I now to share uh, this message and uh, that we would uh, really take it to heart and it would have impact in our lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for doing that. Amen. Amen. So, uh, we looked last week at Psalm 150 that says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So if you're here and breathing, you get to praise the Lord. You should praise the Lord. It's appropriate for you to praise the Lord. Uh, Last week, we looked at just sort of a general Overview. I, I gave you last week the who, where, why, and how of praise uh, based on Psalm 150 that we just looked at. Uh, and I told you last week that we were going to go deeper into the why of praise because I think of all the things that have been helpful in my Christian education, understanding the place for value in worship and what that looks like and why it's important as, a, as opposed to something that's optional has been a game changer for me. As much as any aspect of my Christian education, this has been an important one. So in week one, we looked at a pretty important verse out of John, Jesus speaking, said a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And I didn't really elaborate on that. What I talked about in week one was just the fact that God's looking for worshipers more so than for worship. He's wanting people who are worshipers. And we're going to look at the benefits of why that is so today. But I wanted to speak, first of all, to the spirit and the truth. The first thing that's mentioned there is that we worship him in spirit. And you notice that that, that's a small S, not a capital S. That's speaking of our human spirit, not the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that there's more to you than a body? In fact, the body uh, from a Christian worldview is probably the least significant 
part of our humanness. It's the immaterial parts of our humanness that are really important. That is the way we think about things, our feelings about things, our, our distinctives, our personality, all of the things that well, would require me to talk to you to get to know me. Those are the most important parts of our humanness. And so we're talking about the human spirit here that God wants us to be involved heart, soul, and mind as we worship. He wants us to be involved in all aspects of our humanness. And then the word truth that's mentioned here is a word that um, <clears throat> basically has to do with being authentic, being genuine. I think it's authentic doctrinally is included in there, but also authentic meaning devotional, that our worship should be devotional in a heartfelt response to all that God has done for us. It's kind of Jesus' way of speaking what was the same idea addressed in a little bit more negative light from the prophet Isaiah when, when the prophet said, these people claim to be mine, but praise me with their lips, but they don't mean it. Their hearts are somewhere else, far from me. Their worship of me is just a routine repeated without even thinking about it, just going through the motions. And there's a word that is used, it's actually found in um, the book of Revelation, but it's become sort of a term uh, throughout Christendom, that when our worship looks like this, the word, the word we use for that is, is a term that basically is, your, your worship has become lukewarm. Mm -hmm. To which God responds to that, actually, <laughs> it's kind of, you know, his, his deal of, hey, I'd just assume vomit you out of my mouth and be a part of your lukewarm worship, you know? It basically is like, no thanks. Keep that kind of worship to yourself because it's pointless and it's meaningless. Now, over the years, I have uh, had a handful of occasions where, if not immediately after service, maybe the following Sunday or in the course of conversation during the week. But when it comes to our worship services here on Sunday morning, no one in this room, of course, but there have been a few who have come to me and said, you know, I didn't get anything out of the service. Give me names. <laughs> <laughs> and so I will listen, and I'll say, yeah, tell me more about that. And as they begin to talk and share, and I maybe ask a few questions, it becomes pretty apparent that one of the reasons why they didn't get anything out of it because they showed up here basically in a funk, feeling the stress and pressure of just getting here. Those of you with young children know what I'm talking about. You know, half the time when you've got young children, you come to church and wonder, was it even worth it? Because it was just so much work to get the kids here and they're cranky and, you know, I, I get that. You know, it's difficult. And so when I get to talking about people, it appears that they, they showed up and were expecting, you know, you leading worship and the worship band or maybe my, my talk or, or, you know, something that was going to pull me up and out of the funk that I was in. And so there's this neutral attitude of, I'm here, you better do something to... Lighten my day. Yeah. But there was no participation. There was no engaging with the Lord during this service. And yeah, not surprisingly, you know, they didn't get anything out of it. Now, I think that when we come together, we need to have a better attitude than that. We should come expectant, but we should also understand that, you know, I have to draw near to him if I hope to experience him drawing near to me. I have to go after him if I hope to have him uh, come and lift me and encourage me and inspire me and all of that kind of stuff. And in the North American church, you know, the primary activity that we do to engage the Lord in worship is singing. And I'm not sure what it is about men, but men are just real, you know, hesitant to do the singing thing. Derek alluded to it. Uh, I don't know, you know, maybe it's too feminine or it's too uh, weak or namby-pamby. It's not really soldier warrior-like, or so we think. In reality, man, it's the primary spiritual weapon. But I have observed that men oftentimes don't engage because, you know, it's just not my thing, you know. And over the years, I've heard, you know, on the subject of uh, why I don't sing, there, there's three of them that have sort of come to my mind. Uh, first of all, uh, why I don't sing is that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just not an emotional person, to which I'd say, think again. Actually, God created you with emotions. Now, it's possible that you're broken and your emotions have been shut down. Culture would actually encourage that among men. 
But to say I wasn't created emotional, I don't think so. In reality, you were created to be emotional. A second reason is that well, I feel kind of self-conscious, you know? I'm like, gosh, Barry, you know, if I, I were to sing and, and somebody hears me sing, I, I just feel nervous and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And what are people going to think of me? I don't know, you know, this is sort of a worshiping church. I would actually think if you're self-conscious, you're worried about people thinking of you, sitting there like a bump on a log would probably draw more attention to you. Most living hopers would go, boy, I wonder what's wrong with them. <laughs> and they might be concerned about you. But the reality is, is that most of us actually do come prepared to engage. We do sing. And really, we're not noticing what you're doing at all. You might think, well, yeah, but I'm looking around. Yeah, you're looking around because you're not engaging. Of course you're looking around. But the majority of people are actually just lifting their voice, lifting their hands, engaging, drawing near to God because, well, we want God's presence in our life, you know? And so, you know, on the self-conscious thing, uh, I don't know. You know, it's hard for a counselor to say this, but every now and then it fits. Get over it! <laughs> I always want to say that in my office, but it's not appropriate there. <laughs> Third reason why we don't sing is I'm not musical. I, I, not musical. I can't sing very well. That was me. Mm -hmm. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. Barry, can I tell them what you even told me? Yes. When we were first dating, and um, he introduced me to Christian music, and uh, he introduced me to, to the importance of praise, and... When I got past that, then I, I just wanted to praise him. We'd be in the car, and I'd be singing with the cassettes. Okay, that dated me. Um, and, uh, and I told him one time, I said, you know, I just, I got something in me. Like, I feel like I, I want to sing for God. Like, not just sing like I am now, but like, I want to sing for God. And he looked at me, and he said, oh, I don't know how to tell you this. <laughs> but you sing off pitch. And maybe you could sing in the choir, but you're never going to like, it's never going to be like a ministry. Did I say never? Yeah, you said never, baby. <laughs> and I said, really? Do I sing that bad? He goes, yeah, don't you hear it? And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> so I knew that was a problem. <laughs> if I ain't hearing it. People off pitch never know it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, you know, I resigned myself to sing in the choir and I mouthed it in the choir. And then one day, the pastor came and he said, we're changing things up. We're going to eliminate all the worship leaders. We had a worship leader and two people were captains. He said, we're going to eliminate all the people that are doing it. I'm just going to have one team in the morning and one team at night. And here's my team in the morning. And he had, you know, the superstars. And then at nighttime, um, Sharon Rose is going to lead worship. And Gary Mack's going to be your captain on one side. And this new girl, Colleen, is going to be the captain on the other side. <laughs> I was mouthing it. But apparently I was expressive, and God threw me into it. So I say, maybe you can sing. Because I think I yep. learned how to. Yep. Yeah, every time I hear that story, I'm reminded of my occasional need to eat crow. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, not singing... I. I this is an actual relationship. There's a living God who gave us a voice that wants to connect with us. And in a relationship, when one has been kind to you, it's appropriate to say thank you. It's appropriate to, to acknowledge that verbally. I mean, it'd be like, you know, if I were to say, you know, I, I do want to express my love to you, but I, I don't like the sound of my voice, so I'm going to let others say thanks to you and tell you how wonderful you are because I don't like the sound of my voice. That would be weird. Yeah, that would be weird. And it's weird in our relationship with God. I would say get over it. Yes, you would. <laughs> yes, you would. <laughs> okay? Yeah, and so I just give you permission. I promise you, I've learned from Colleen uh, from the experience she just told there that I will never ask anyone to not sing again. That was my bad, my immaturity coming out there. I, uh, I actually love it when I hear young Christians just praying genuinely and authentically and haven't learned their Christianese yet. I love that. And I love it when, when people sing that 
aren't necessarily on pitch or perfect. But if I can see they're just lifting up their voices to God, I rejoice in that. I delight in that. Yeah. So you guys go for it, okay? So uh, I told you today, last week, that I wanted to talk more about the why of praise. In fact, today I want to talk to you about uh, seven benefits of praise. That We're not going to get to all seven of them today. If we're lucky, we'll get to four of them. Uh, and I'll also give you a little teaser regarding next week that the best are for next week, although today's are good, but yeah, the next best are ones are next week, yeah. and so that's my teaser to get you all to come back next week. Uh, so let's take a look at this. The first ones are just kind of simple and obvious, uh, but um, boy, they're, they're game changers nevertheless. So why do I want to praise the Lord? What are the benefits of doing that? Uh, number one, praising God lifts my spirit. Yeah. Look at Psalm 42. The psalmist is saying, you know, why am I so discouraged? Why, why am I so troubled and upset? So he's not in a good place, okay? He's got issues going on here. He says, instead, I'm going to put my hope in God. I'm going to praise him once again as my Savior and my God. And even when my heart is breaking, I'm going to remember his kindness. I mean, you know, that occasional discouragement is the human condition, We've all been there, and we will be there again, some of you, before the day is over. It's just a fact of life, that there's disappointments, there's losses, there's grief and sorrow, there's baffling setbacks that take place in our life. Life is just hard a lot. And in our culture, my experience has been that culturally speaking, people tend to, when things get really hard, as the psalmist is perhaps in a place, in our culture, people do one of two extremes. They either uh, go into full-on denial and uh, do anything they can to distance themselves from the heartache, the sorrow, the grief, the discouragement. You know, I mean, they just binge on Netflix TV shows or binge on drugs and alcohol, binge on something. Something just to grow numb and forget about the upsetting thing. That's what culture does on one hand. Or they tend to go completely to the other extreme where they just take a deep dive and are going to soak in the negative and the discouraging and difficult thing that they're going through. I mean, they just are marinating in it. So it's either all on, avoid it at all costs, or... You know, just soak it up and uh, it becomes your total reality. In the Christian life, our Christian worldview teaches us that when we're going through tough stuff, the appropriate response for us as Christ followers is that we don't go into denial. We actually acknowledge it. We acknowledge it thoroughly. However deep and difficult it is, we have no denial about that. We acknowledge the hardship. And we are asked to change whatever is in our power to change. You know, if there's something that we can do, hands and feet, that's why he gave us hands and feet, something we can do by way of problem solving, to take care of business, then by all means we should do that. And regarding the things that are difficult and discouraging that we don't really have any control over, that we don't have any power over, regarding those things we just trust the Lord we turn it over to him. We look to him for his help and his guidance. And until the answer comes, we continue to trust and to praise him. That's just solid Christian theology. That's what we do with difficulty and hardship. I like what the psalmist said about you know, remembering your kindness. That's a tool, living hope. When you don't see anything to praise God about in the moment, in the present, you do well to go back to the things that he's already done for you and to thank him again for those things. Come back to that stuff that he's been faithful to you over the year. And here's why. Because praise takes my focus off my problems and puts it back on God. Amen. Amen. This is how we don't do marinating in the problem. We've acknowledged it. We've looked at it. We've had our feelings about it. We've even done whatever footwork we can do, but having done that, now we put our focus back onto God. Yeah, and remembering his kindness, remembering his faithfulness, remembering the times that he brought us through stuff, remembering what the scripture says about him, that he promises never to leave us or forsake us. Mm -hmm. Unlike numbing out with something, this 
leaves you fully aware of what you're going through, but also aware that you're not going through it alone. And that the one who stands with you is all powerful. He is God Almighty, and nothing can stop him. Amen. And that's, that's a game changer. You still may go through it, but Jesus is in that boat with you, and that storm won't overtake you. Good, good. Yeah, and I think that as we do that, if we keep our focus on, on God and not on the problem, we start to experience a little bit of what was promised through the prophet Isaiah. To all who mourn in Israel, he gives beauty for ashes, joy instead of sadness, and praise instead of despair. Yeah. How many of you have been on the receiving end of that before, where the Lord has just kind of lifted you out of the muck and mire? It's a, it's a real deal. He does that for us. All right, let's move on to benefit number two, which is praising God helps me sense God's presence. And notice I use the word sense here. Um, I think we all know that one of the attributes of God is that he's omnipresent, which means he is at all places at all times. But there are plenty of occasions where we don't feel his presence. We don't sense his presence. And for a host of reasons. I think, you know, at the top of the list for me is just stress and deadline type of stuff. You know, it's difficult for me to feel God's presence when I'm stressed out and Man, there's always 10 things on my day, any day, that uh, if I allow would stress me out. But stress can make us difficult to find his, his presence. Uh, worries and concerns can be in the mix. Uh, besetting sins that we haven't resolved yet can, can take us away from God's presence. A whole bunch of reasons. But thankfully, when we struggle with God's closest, when we're just having a hard time feeling it, there are things that we can do, things that we should do. You're doing it right now, as a matter of fact, of you know, being here, gathering together for worship time is one of those things that you can do. While you're uh, uh, doing that, you can encourage one another, uh, both here and during the course of the week. That helps us to sense God's closeness. We praise together corporately, and we can praise him individually. I actually do this every single day. The big question, though, is uh, what do I do when I'm just not feeling God's closeness? And the answer is you praise him anyway. Yeah. You praise him anyway. I said last week, you know, it's easier to act your way into a feeling than it is to feel your way into an action. Mm -hmm. It's easier to act your way into a feeling than it is to feel your way into an action. And I think that's true, really, in all areas of life. You married people, you would do well to understand what your spouse needs in order to feel loved and to step up and to love that way, whether you're feeling it or not. And if you would do that, you would actually begin to experience some of those in love feelings. I think about like another example would be self-respect. You may not be feeling a whole lot of self-respect or that you have dignity and worth and value in your life. But if you get a, a focus and a picture of this is how people of, of worth and value live. This is how they interact with others. This is what they do. This is what they don't do. And you've got a clear picture of that and you choose to live that way, I promise you the feeling of worth and value will come along eventually, probably much quicker than you realize. I think about financial security. You know, if you're living with the feeling of financial insecurity, if you were to actually adopt the lifestyle principles of financially secure people and begin to live those principles, I promise you, eventually, you will feel financially secure because those principles actually bring us into financial security. So it's just a principle throughout life in all important areas of life. And so, you know, if you're not feeling God being very close to you, you live like one who does experience the presence of God. It means you, you give him heartfelt worship, you give him thanksgiving, you give him gratitude, you sing songs of praise. Yeah, it's, it's walking in truth, but sometimes the, the, the situation you're in or whatever is screaming so loud you just can't get there feeling-wise. And so, like Barry said, if you behave in the way that you should, and 
you can do that. One of the ways you can do that is by reading your, reading your Bible, reading the Word, being in the Word, knowing God. There's lots of ways to know God. I would just say that music and praise is a pathway that makes that very simple. I think that's why God wanted us to incorporate music in our worship of him. I believe it is for our benefit because there is something about music. I remember when I was a young Christian, Barry telling me, learn these songs. A lot of the songs we used to sing were all scripture, weren't they, Loretta? You know, they were all scripture. And he said, because the Holy Spirit will bring that song to your mind, which he's bringing that scripture to your mind. And for some people, like me, it was easier for me to remember the truth if I had it to a tune than it was just reading it in, in my word. But it was the truth. It was the truth. So praise is a wonderful pathway, a wonderful avenue. When we're not feeling it, we say it. We remind ourselves that God is almighty, that God does love me. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. I don't care what you've done. You didn't do anything good for Jesus to die on the cross for you. He did that all because of the things you were going to do that weren't good. God doesn't love you less because you've done something wrong. And he doesn't love you more when you're good. He loves you. And you got to confess that. So you got to sing songs. And you got to just say that. And you will begin to internalize his love. Mm -hmm. Psalm 75, God, we praise you and thank you, in fact, because you are near. And the idea there is, hey, whether I feel it or not, I still am going to praise him, still going to thank him, because he's omnipresent, whether we feel it or not. Psalm 140 says this, that the righteous praise your name, and they live in your presence. And I bring up that verse only to say that it's a theme you'll find throughout Scripture, that praise and presence actually go together. If you want more of God's presence, you have to do more of this praise and worship. By the way, it's just an earmark of maturity. You know, children tend to live by and are ruled by feelings. Adults tend to live by and ruled by truth. What's right? in spite of whatever feelings I may have. And so bringing your praise in order to have more of God's presence is what mature people sitting around waiting until I'm feeling it is kind of what children do. So be an adult, okay? Benefit number three, uh, praising God enlarges my perception of him. You want me to go get your... Yes. (laughs) I'm like, I had uh, an object lesson for you. And considering how much time I spent this morning looking for this thing. You use that every night to read. I know. <laughs> so here's the deal. You know, number three here, praising God enlarges my perception of him. Um, Psalm 69 says, I will praise the name of the Lord with a song and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. And that word magnify actually does have to do with making larger, much like the purpose of a magnifying glass. So, you know, if I look at something under a magnifying glass, the idea is it perceptionally becomes larger. And so this is the idea where, you know, I am going to look in a magnifying way at God my Father to make him larger than, uh, well, not larger than he is. I'm, he, he, the magnification doesn't actually make him larger in reality, but it does make him larger in our heart and in our mind. It's sort of be like looking through a telescope, as Fred here today, yeah. Those stars are really, really big, but they look tiny in the sky. And when you look through that telescope, you see them bigger, right? Right. Yeah. Good illustration, good illustration. And so when I magnify God in my praise and my worship, in my eyes, he gets bigger. And it's a big deal, and here's why, is that when God gets larger in my life, my problems shrink. Yeah. <laughs> and the opposite, by the way, I should say as well, that if I magnify my problems, my God has a way of shrinking in my mind, in my mind mm-hmm. and in my heart in impractical ways that matter. So when we praise God, we actually magnify him, which results in our problems becoming more manageable. (laughs) I wish I could sit here and lie to you and say, it makes all your problems go away, but that would be a lie. But it makes our problems more manageable. When we magnify him, our faith rises, 
that God can actually handle this. Our faith rises. We actually begin to believe that God can handle the thing that I'm going through. When we magnify God, our confidence increases that, hey, I'll get through this. I know for me, you know, my fearful nature at times, I look at some dilemma I'm facing and something, man, it's just going to be the end of me. It's going to be the end of, of uh, you know, whatever I'm concerned about. I, I, I can be guilty of catastrophizing. You think? Remember yeah. the, we're going to live in a box down by the river? <laughs> Seriously, we were one time at lunch and I was watching a homeless person. I said, is, is that really where you think we'll end up if something goes wrong financially? And he's like, yeah, that's what I feel. I'm like, we could both get jobs at McDonald's and not end up there. I mean, I, but anyways, yeah. I digress. Yeah, it's, so it's when ridiculous, he said, no argument. <laughs> when he says he could go there, and so he's speaking from experience here, what happens when you magnify the fear, Yep. when you focus on it? It becomes bigger. But if we magnify the Lord in our praise and our worship, I mean, our fear is replaced with serenity and a sense of well-being. We have a sense that we'll actually, you know, uh, um, get through this. I mean, we'll sleep better. We'll have fewer stress-related problems in our life, health problems in our life. Psalm 145 says, The Lord is great and is worthy of our highest praise because his greatness is beyond understanding. And that word great there, it actually means large. Large in size, large in capabilities, large in power, large in mercy, large in compassion, large in kindness, large in generosity. Every attribute of God, mm -hmm. it's saying that that attribute is large, very large. Large enough that we can say with confidence that with God nothing is impossible. That's how large, because of his greatness. In fact, it is so large, as is stated here, it's beyond our comprehension, beyond our understanding. I mean, trying to understand the largeness of God, the greatness of God, would be sort of like an ant trying to understand the internet. It's just not in the mental faculty. It's not in the comprehension ability for us to even begin to scratch the surface of how large our God is and how capable and competent he is. But when we begin to praise, begin to magnify him, we actually begin to increase and enlarge our view of him. Our view of him becomes bigger and larger. And our problems actually begin to shrink in our heart and our mind. We begin to see his, through eyes that um, see our circumstances in a different light. We begin to uh, um, see the largest of God's hands that are actually able to help us. We begin to see the largest of God's heart that he really cares about what it is that we're going through. We begin to see the largest of God's power, that he can work all of these things together for good that we're struggling with and that we're going through. So listen, whatever problem you might have right now, I won't ask for a show of hands, but hey, you got, you know, you're breathing, so I know you got problems, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's just the human condition. So know this, that whatever problem you're experiencing right now that's got you afraid, intimidated, nervous, or worried, the antidote is to sing about the largeness, the greatness yes. of our God. Because he becomes larger and problems begin to shrink. Five minutes. Think we can do number four in five minutes? I don't think we should because there's so much I want to say. Okay. <laughs> about number four? No, about just what we're talking about right now. Okay. I'll have so much to say about number four next week. That's true. So I I've told never known her to have an absence of words. That's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just sitting here. And if I point, I'm sorry. Barry told me when, when you preach, I point. I'm like, I'm like the little portuguese. I get my little finger out. Because I love you. This is a finger of love, not shame. <laughs> it's absolutely. Yeah. Um, So, we, Barry and I recently went and saw a movie. What was that movie called? Um, Redeeming Love. Redeeming Love. Yeah, and it was based off of a Christian book. 
And it was about uh, a man who, well, I think it's based out of scripture where the Lord told the prophet to marry a harlot, but it was about, so this is Redeeming Love, it's about a man, I don't want to give the story away, but it's about a man who God told him and uh, that this woman was to be his wife, and she was a woman who had had a, a horrible past and was um, a practicing harlot at the time. And uh, he went to her, and um, he purchased time with her, um, not to sleep with her, but to tell her, I'll take you away from all this. I love you, and I want you to be my wife. And it goes through this whole process, and she doesn't go at first, and then she finally does go, and back and forth, back and forth. But you see in the movie how he sincerely loved her, saw value in her. But she repeatedly could not receive it because she was locked into a mindset that was based in all the bad things that had happened to her as a child that was based in the things that she did because of that. You know, sometimes the things that happen to you put you in a position where then you do things that now you are ashamed of. And the enemy will come and he will just beat you up about that. He is merciless. He will tempt you to make choices that are wrong for you and then turn around and say, look at yourself. Do you think God could ever love you? And so it was a beautiful movie about this woman finally learning to receive the love that was there. And that's a big part, not just the love and the forgiveness, but the hope and the courage and the faith to move forward. Most of your battle is between your ears. Most of your struggle is in your mind. Most of what I've struggled with over the years is internalizing what God has done for me. Jesus did the heavy lifting for us on the cross. He did it for us and he set us free. But we still live in our prisons holding the keys in our hands. We're not locked in. We remain in. And the way we step out, and sometimes we step out a little, and it's hard, and then we're right back in that prison, but we step out a little. But we get a taste. We get a taste of his goodness, mm -hmm. of his love. And we speak with our mouths, and we worship him, and we sing about it, and we read his word. And we begin to, um, we're, you're going to find the truth in his word. But walking in that truth is another thing, right? And that's where praise is a wonderful, when we'll talk about it next week, weapon. But it's a wonderful key that you have, that you lay hold of. Start by just, in, you know, in your car, man. Roll your windows up and put your music on loud. You know, I don't mean to, but when I'm in my car and I'm singing, I, I, I like, sometimes I, I direct the worship, you know, like, like I know what they're going to do, but I go like this when they're going to sing it again. And I'm like, what are you doing? You know, I laugh at myself, but then I decided, well, I'm, I'm leading worship with the angels. I'm telling the angels what to do. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just a freak in the car. So if you drive by me and see me, you know, just kind of look the other way or enjoy it and laugh at me. <laughs> Um, but everybody will wonder if you're taking your medication or not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but, but I, I'm, I'm urging you for your sake, let yourself be free. Let yourself begin to, and if you're already a, a praiser, step it up a notch. Just There's take always, it up always a, more notches. There's always more. Oh no. <laughs> Now, now, now she's not going to want to drive with me. Uh, step it up a notch. Step it up a notch. Um, because it's, it's good for you. Good. Good. All righty. That's enough for this morning. Let's, uh, let's stand and we're going to close in prayer. You should be proud of your pastor right now. You have no idea what it is for me to overcome this OCD moment of leaving blank lines on your outline there. <laughs> 
not being able to give you the answers to those. <laughs> He's going to go home and worship God. <laughs> Praise God. Admit to himself God is bigger than the outline. <laughs> Father, I love living hope. I, I thank you for my, these beloved. I thank you for uh, the goodness that I see you doing in their lives. Lord, a big part of growing up and maturing in you is to love you back. Your love for us has been profound. Help us to love you back. Help us to be emotionally expressive in our love back to you. Help us to uh, give the honor and the worth and the value that is due your name. Amen. Thank you so much, Lord. Blessings upon your people. I pray that as they leave here today, they would go with a sense of being on mission, that you would provide opportunities for them to make your love known to people who are far from you. Take that as an assignment, Living Hope. Go and enter your mission field. Make Jesus known.